It's Thursday, May 27. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Training for sustainable bauxite mining and land title security. These were two of the issues raised by Transport and Mining Minister Robert Montague in his contribution to the sectoral debate in Parliament on Wednesday. Jamaica's bauxite sector has had serious challenges in recent years, but it seems to be turning around with a reported 20.82 million tons exported between 2017 and 2019. Minister Montague says the Mining Training School is training persons involved in the industry to lift the standards and transform it into a more sustainable sector. Portfolio Minister Robert Montague says the idea of training persons in the mining industry came from Member of Parliament for Central Clarendon, Lester Michael Henry. I wish to again pay tribute to the member from Central Clarendon, the Honorable Michael Lester Henry, for this idea and the hard work he did in laying this foundation. The trainings have started and it is being delivered with the assistance of the Council of Community Colleges of Jamaica. Excelsior Community College has led on this and we thank them. Importantly, we have done, done two courses on quarry management already. Minister Montague also notes that the University of Technology is starting a degree program in mining this August. We encourage all who have an interest to enroll. On this note, we wish to thank the Chair of the Quarries Advisory Committee, all the consultants, committee members, and the staff at Mines and Geology, and all who worked tirelessly to get us here. On the matter of land titling, he says the Ministry will be using the Bauxite and Alumina Industries Special Provisions Act to speed up the land titling process for families who are relocated, given a new house and new lands, while their titled land was taken in order to facilitate mining activities. Many of these persons have been waiting for decades to get a land title for the new lands they now occupy. The process has been slow over the years. We intend to use, for the first time, the Bauxite and Alumina Industries Special Provisions Act to speed up this land titling process by using the power of vesting orders contained in the Act. These powers, Madam Speaker, were always used to assist the companies. This government, this government led by Andrew Holness, this caring government, in order to correct the wrongs and injustices of the past, has decided to use it for our people, our citizens. Minister Montague also shared details of discussions on the possibility of extracting rare earth elements from local land. It is a proven fact that our red mud possess rare earth elements. It is the extraction of same that is of concern, especially the cost. The Jamaica Bauxite Institute is actively looking at new methodologies to do so, and we have not given up on this project. In addition, I have sought legal advice as to whether Jamaica has any rights to the new metals found in red mud being held in the United States. One thought is that the license granted was for bauxite, and our laws, the Mining Act, says if you have a license to mine one item, and in the process you find another, you must immediately inform the commissioner, get his permission, and ultimately pay your royalty. Recent surveys by private sector interests have indicated that there exist potentially large deposits of rare earth elements at a location in Jamaica. Rare earth elements, Madam Speaker, as you know, are critical to the growth of the green sustainable economy worldwide. He says more testing is underway and more updates will be made as soon as it's commercially advisable to do so. You can watch the recording of Minister Montague's speech on PBCJ's YouTube channel. Simone Absalom Gale reporting for the news on PBCJ.
Students will soon be able to move from Old Harbor and Linstead into Spanish Town by train. The Jamaica Urban Transit Company, JUTC, and the Education Ministry are working with the Jamaica Heritage Trust to restore station houses, especially the Old Harbor Station. Transport Minister Robert Montague told his colleagues in Parliament Wednesday that students will disembark in Spanish Town and carried to various schools by JUTC buses. Along with the students, Teachers, parents, healthcare, and other essential workers will be prioritized for this service at first. Last Thursday, Madam Speaker, the train ran from Spanish Town to Linstead and back on a test run. This is not just talk, it's a clear demonstration of the will of this go government to build back stronger. Minister Montague says he is hopeful that the service will be expanded over time. We will also have one train left in Kingston to move between downtown and Marcus Garvey Drive to provide transportation and leisure trips or to just give people the train experience. This will bring economic activities for the communities along the line as the train will stop in these communities and allow persons to vend and offer other services. No big box stores will be courted. This is an opportunity for the little man. Only the people from these communities will be allowed to interact with the passengers. In addition, we want to rent out coaches to different businesses so as you ride, you can shop. Spain has pledged to donate 5 million vaccine doses to Latin America and the Caribbean, and Canada has committed 50 million Canadian dollars to support expansion of COVID-19 vaccine access in the region. Director of the Pan American Health Organization, Dr. Carissa Etienne, says she is encouraged by the response from developed countries in facilitating increased access to vaccines. Simone Absalom Gale shares the details from PAHO's recent virtual media brief. The PAHO director says vaccine supplies have been limited and that has been concerning based on the number of COVID-19 case counts and deaths. She says the new collaboration between the government of Canada and the Pan American Health Organization will improve the health and protection of populations in situations of high vulnerability due to COVID-19. While we are pleased to see the arrival of more COVAX doses in our region, the reality is that we still face a glaring gap in access to vaccines. Countries in our region have consistently reported some of the highest weekly case counts and deaths. Our hospitals are full and, and many patients are not getting the care that they desperately need. Dr. Etienne expressed the hope that in the coming months, the vulnerable vaccine supply will catch up with demand. As wealthy countries expand vaccination, many of the most disproportionately impacted countries are being left behind. So we continue to urge the global community to help us expand vaccine coverage in the Americas. In the short term, as supplies are limited, vaccine donations offer us the best chance to fill immediate gaps. Despite the promise of vaccine supplies in coming months, Dr. Etienne says public health safety measures continue to be important. Please ensure um, adequate hand, frequent hand washing, physical uh, and, and social distancing, and also the wearing of masks. This is uh, the intervention that is most available to us now, and it has proven that it is effective. PAHO has delivered more than 12 million COVAX procured vaccine doses to countries in the Latin America and the Caribbean. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says he frowns on those who continue to encourage informal settlements across the island. He says the failure to recognize property rights is a recipe for destruction. Mr. Holness says his administration is committed to empowering more Jamaicans and positively changing communities through property rights. You have a set of persons in the country, some of them claim to be intellectuals, who carry this narrative as if to suggest that we are going to correct the historical injustices, the unequal distributions that have taken place 
in the past by going about land settlement in a disorderly way. There are those who continue to encourage persons to say, go and go squat on the land. Nobody now have it a government land. Just go and go build out on it. And there are those who continue to push the view that we must ignore property rights and just go and settle as you wish and as you will. That is a recipe for destruction. The very reason why we have these problems that we have now is because we have been settling land in this way. The government is aware of this. And government is very sensitive to the social dynamics and the historical unequal distributions that have taken place as it relates to land. And it is within the capacity of government and the intention of this government to correct that. But we are going to do it in an orderly way and in an equitable way. Mr. Holness was speaking at the recent opening of the Harmony Beach Park in Montego Bay. The park is now the recreational focal point for the city of Montego Bay. It is officially open to the public from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. There have been reports in the media recently of an area of disputed land in eastern St. Thomas called Old Piera. Residents there are disputing the claims of ownership of the land by former Member of Parliament, Pernell Charles Sr. His daughter, MP Dr. Michelle Charles, found herself in the middle of confrontation with irate residents while the area was visited by opposition leader Mark Golding. Melvin Pennant has that story. When our news team visited Old Piera in eastern St. Thomas, this is what we found, irate residents. Yes, they claim that they have been disrupted from gainful employment by the owner of the land former member of parliament pernell charles senior the disgruntled citizens recently reached out to the opposition leader mark golden i'm here today at the invitation of local community members um, as leader of the opposition they reached out to me and said that they were very unhappy about what's happening here at Old Pier. So I visited and essentially what has happened is that the beach and an island off the coast, which is accessible because the water is not very deep, um, which had been used as a camp site for an eco-friendly um, camp operation where persons from the local community were making a, a good living or hustling off of it because they could cook, they could supply food and beverage and other services needed by the visitors who were camping there. That had been shut down by the person who claims to be the owner, former MP Colonel Charles, and um, signs have been erected um, saying it's all private property and so on. The beach is also a beach where fishermen go to go out to sea from and there's a right of way which they have used Mr. Golding sided with the residents. Money can't buy this. This is priceless. And if the community has always had the benefit of coming here to recreate, to, to enjoy themselves, cook a little food, converse, meditate, go and meet, with the, the MP should not allow that to, she must protect the people and their rights to use this. Eastern St. Thomas Member of Parliament Dr. Michelle Charles also visited the area on the same day. When I got there, I was quite surprised because I saw the um, council caretaker for the Dalby Division and Mr. Beckford, which is a, a, I don't know, I think he's a liaison officer, and he accused me and my family of stealing land. Mr. Charles Sugarland, that's madness. Mr. Beckford. We don't have taken on him, no, so we won't take this. We will fight to the bitter hen to defend this from the people. You and your father need to go back to St. Anne and leave in Eastern St. Thomas. You have taken enough land. In all these parcels of land that the former MP is claiming ownership of, 
We have not seen no paperwork from him. Neither have we seen any title to say that he is the owner to support his claim. This was Dr. Charles' response to the accusations. So I said to him, Mr. Beckford, call the police. <laughs> the reality of it is, it's very easy for someone to look up who owns what property. Uh, it's, it's something that you just simply go and do. And I told the leader of the opposition that he can go ahead and do that. Everyone has access to find out who owns what property. But for me, I am grateful that the government of Jamaica has taken up under their wing the parish of St. Thomas, in particular, Eastern St. Thomas. She said there are governmental development plans in the pipeline for the parish. We are a diamond in the rough. And we have so many plans for the people of St. Thomas, and all that the government has planned is in this book. So I made little copies and I circle, circulated them around, and you can go um, to the Ministry of Tourism and find out what we are uh, planning to do for Eastern St. Thomas. Melvin Pennant, PBCJ News. Late Ambassador Anthony Johnson was laid to rest on Thursday after an official memorial service. The service took place at the St. Augustine Kingston College Chapel on North Street in Kingston. He died on April 28 at the age of 82. And on behalf of the Jamaica Labour Party, we say farewell and goodbye to a stalwart, a member who served well. Thank you. Your influence in our lives and the love we have for you will never fade, dwindle in importance, or cease to be a point of reference as we grow older and continue learning. As you said in a past interview, there is always something new to learn every day. He developed an intense love for his country, the land and the people, here and abroad. I treasure each memory proudly as I reflect on Dad as he was and how he is remembered. Daddy believed books needed to be read and written by Jamaicans. He said books saved him. They were his refuge during a challenging childhood, and they created his path for opportunities. He also often reminded that we as a people don't tell our stories enough, so we don't embed enough national pride in our children from early. And this is why he wrote the child-oriented Great Jamaican Leaders and Great Jamaican Scientists to try and locate within the education system simplified information about known and less known leaders and Jamaicans who had accomplished in their fields. Ambassador Johnson was a former Jamaica Labour Party member of parliament, senator, diplomat, economist, lecturer and ambassador to the United States. He was also High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Finland, the kingdoms of Sweden, Norway and Denmark and Ireland, and a permanent representative to the Organization of American States, OAS. Motorists will get some ease at the pumps this week as both gas and diesel prices will see a decrease. We get this and other key market details and news in this business report. Bank of Jamaica Governor Richard Bells has indicated that the central bank continues to be successful at guiding inflation within the 4-6% target range. His remarks come on the heels of announcing a three-year renewal of the island's medium-term inflation target range of 4% to 6%. The central bank governor made the announcement last Friday at the BOJ's quarterly media briefing, noting that over the past 40 months leading up to April 2021, inflation has been below 6% on 38 occasions, or 95% of the time. As I've said in the past, the main reason for inflation going above the target on two occasions was temporary increases in agricultural prices due to either droughts or floods. On the flip side, inflation fell below the lower end of the target on 15 occasions over the period, again mainly due to volatility in agricultural prices as well as declines in international oil prices.
According to data from the Statistical Institute of Jamaica, the inflation rate for the 12 months leading up to April 2021 was 3.8%, just below the lower end of the bank's inflation target and lower than the 5.2% recorded for March 2021. Governor Biles sought to explain the reason for the reduction. The deceleration in inflation was mainly related to a reduction in electricity rates. Core inflation, which excludes increases in agriculture and fuel prices for the 12 months leading up to April, was, however, 5.5%, up from 5.3% in March. This increase was in part attributed to a rise in processed food inflation. Going forward, the BOJ's Monetary Policy Committee indicated a near-term outlook lower than the one shared in February 2021, a change primarily related to the committee's updated view that agricultural price increases for the June to December period will be smaller than previously anticipated, given expectations for better weather conditions. Going forward, the MPC anticipates that annualized consumer price inflation will evolve as follows over the next three quarters. At June of this year, three and a half to four and a half percent. At September of this year, four and a half to five and a half percent. And at December of this year, back to three and a half to four and a half percent. Recently announced price increases for some processed foods, driven by higher imported commodity prices and shipping costs, have been taken into account. Beyond this horizon of December of this year, our forecast for inflation is to remain within the target range of 4 to 6 percent. Inflation is projected to average 4.8 percent over the next two years, a forecast that anticipates that commodity oil and grain prices will not rise much beyond current levels. In the meantime, Mr. Biles says Jamaica has entered into a new paradigm of central banking with the April 16 implementation of the Bank of Jamaica Amendment Act 2020. This new law has refocused the primary mandate of the bank towards the maintenance of price stability while strengthening its governance, accountability and financial arrangements in line with international best practices. The bank now has the authority, among other things, to make monetary policy decisions towards the attainment of the government's inflation target without any external influence. It will, however, be fully accountable to the public through Parliament for these decisions. Monetary policy decisions will no longer be solely determined by the governor of the bank and will now be determined by a five-member statutory committee called the Monetary Policy Committee. The MPC made its first monetary policy decision on Thursday, May 20. According to the latest ex-refinery costs from state-owned oil refinery Petrojam, Jamaican motorists should see a decrease at the pumps in the prices of gasoline and diesel, effective Thursday, May 27. 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $142.90 and $148.63 per litre respectively after a decrease of $3.06 and $2.35. Following a decrease of $2.14, automotive diesel fuel will be sold for $135.28 per litre while ultra-low sulfur diesel is down by $1.93 and will be sold for $144.52 per litre. Kerosene will be sold for $111.72 per litre following a price drop of $1.44. Propane liquid petroleum will be sold for $54.68 per litre, up by $1.04, and butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $59.80 per litre after an increase of 50 cents. Expect price changes as marketing companies and retailers will add their markup to these prices. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,515 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 91 stocks, of which 38 advanced, 43 declined, and 10 traded firm. 
The junior market index advanced by 26 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Cargo Handlers Limited, Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Barita Investments Limited, and Burger Paints Jamaica Limited. Trading firm were 1834 Investments Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company, and Blue Power Group Limited. Sagico Select Funds Limited Financial was the volume leader with 18.9 million units, followed by Pulse Investments Limited with 1.7 million units, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with 1.3 million units. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, May 26, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $149.73. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $125.09. The pound sterling traded for $214.10. And the euro sold for an average $185.86. Oil prices dipped on Thursday as concerns about demand in India and the potential for a rise in Iranian supplies offset optimism over the U.S. and European summer driving season. Brent crude futures lost 75 cents to settle at $67.98 a barrel. West Texas intermediate futures dropped 70 cents or 1.6% at $65.51 a barrel. And further afield in Trinidad and Tobago, the government is urging non-essential businesses to stop trying to get around the public health regulations, noting that there has been an uptick of both small and large food establishments offering pre-packaged meals. Sunil Lala reports on government's meeting with representatives from the business community on Wednesday. Energy Minister Stuart Young says government is aware that many non-essential businesses have been attempting to get around and also break the regulations and believes this continued movement of people may lengthen the time to get back to a phased reopening since the main goal at this time is to get infections to a minimum. They think they're trying to beat the regulations <laughs> in the back rooms, carrying out e-commerce, trying to do deliveries or asking persons to pick up. By definition, that increases the movement and it can be contributing to why we're not seeing the numbers go down as quickly as we would like. Trade and Industry Minister Paula gopi Schoon says she understands restaurants have been doing what they can to keep workers employed, but says even pre-packaging food to sell in supermarkets could have negative effects. Number one, you're bringing out your employees when this is against the regulation, regulations. That's one wrong. And, this, and the second wrong is now you, you're taking that into supermarkets and you're adding another train of traffic. Mr. Young notes even furniture and appliance stores have been offering online and delivery services which should not be done during this time. He says the e-commerce aspect as well as curbside pickup would be considered when there's a phased reopening. The ministers met with members of the business community on Wednesday, including several chambers, the manufacturing and contracting sector, DOMA, as well as the Supermarkets Association. They were asked to submit their views, options and solutions moving forward for the eventual phased reopening. Another meeting with the business community is expected to take place next week. Sonolala, TTT News. And in sports, we are in the creases with cricket. Recently, the West Indies Professional Cricket League had its players draft, with franchises opting for homegrown players to complete their 15-man squads for the new season. With franchises requiring just two players to complete their squads, only two rounds of the draft took place by a video call, and most of the picks were emerging players with little first-class experience. All 90 players across these six franchises will receive 12-month retainer contracts starting July 1. And with that, we pull up the stumps on today's newscast. On behalf of our entire hard-working production team, we here at PBCJ wish you pleasant viewing. Stay safe. <laughs>